the cross road that we have a we have a very uh, good topic in diabetes that is an whenever uh, we talk about kidney disease in diabetes it is always uh, diabetic kidney disease but uh, in clinical practice we do miss a uh, lot of uh, non diabetic kidney disease and uh, which is always uh, treatable disease and uh, when to suspect uh, all this uh, non diabetic kidney disease uh, in a patient with uh, diabetes and renal impairment to talk on this uh, we have the best person here dr martin ps as uh, sudesh sir already told he has uh, delivered this uh, talk in another forum and it is uh, well appreciated that's why we brought in here and uh, it, a lot of practical uh, tips and uh, take home message uh, from this topic and uh, uh martin uh, is uh, has completed his mbbs from calicut medical college and uh, md also from calicut medical college and uh, yes dennis dm nephro from the prestigious uh, government stanley medical college uh, chennai now he is working as a consultant uh, nephrologist in malabar hospital in nepalam and uh, pvs sunrise hospital and uh, his special interest is in interventional nephrology over to uh, martin hello am i audible yeah fine uh, thank you rohit sir for that uh, wonderful introduction uh, i thank uh, rssbi kerala chapter Uh, i thank uh, suresh kumar sir dr chandni madam for giving me this opportunity to speak among this august audience so i will directly dive right into the topic non diabetic kidney disease in diabetics dr martin can you unmute your video uh one second uh am i audible sir Uh, you are audible your video is uh, you are not visible video oh. video unmute right you are audible and you are uh, now it's okay uh, so i will uh, right away dive into the topic so this is the first slide i want to mention renal dysfunction in diabetics can be due to three reasons either we can be we must be dealing with a diabetic kidney disease or we might be dealing with a non diabetic kidney disease and at times a non diabetic kidney disease might be superimposed on a diabetic kidney disease so this is the natural history of diabetic kidney disease that we have studied so here in the x axis we have the years and in y axis you have the gfr so once a patient gets diagnosed with diabetes initially the gfr would be normal and as the patient's diabetic control worsens the patient can develop diabetic nephropathy and with that initially there is a stage of hyperfiltration where the gfr increases and after that stage the patient's gfr slowly declines 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 and the patient finally ends up in azotemia and end stage renal disease this drop in gfr is superimposed by the leak of albumin in urine and as you can see initially the leak of albumin will be minimal moderately increased albuminuria and then finally goes in for frank proteinuria and as the patient develops end stage renal disease that also disappears so monjensen in type 1 diabetes uh, he uh, explain the natural history of diabetic kidney disease in type 1 diabetes and classified it into different stages so initially there is glomerular hyperfiltration where the gfr urine albumin blood pressure everything is normal then comes the stage of a silent stage where some patients might develop mild hypertension in the incipient stage the gfr starts to decline and microalbuminuria albuminuria starts to appear in overt nephropathy the gfr falls again goes in for frank proteinuria hypertension would be there and in end stage renal disease the patient would become uremic and would require some form of renal replacement therapy for survival 
but this is not the case for type 2 diabetes. So here is a chart which shows the trajectories of how diabetic kidney disease behaves in type 2 diabetes patients. So in the x-axis, you have albumin, albuminuria, worsening albuminuria. In the y-axis, you have declining GFR. So this is the classical path where once the patient starts to develop diabetic kidney disease, the patient goes through a stage of uh, microalbuminuria, then frank proteinuria, and once uh, proteinuria has worsened, the patient's GFR starts declining, and finally, patient ends up in end stage renal disease. But a patient who follows medical advice correctly and gets treated with a, from a doctor and uh, gets his diabetes under control, uses AC inhibitors and ARBs. So in those patients, a regression of albuminuria is possible. But there are some group of patients where the decline of GFR is so rapid that you don't even get time to properly treat and the patient directly, rapidly ends up in end-stage renal failure. Now, recently, a new group of uh, diabetic kidney disease has been described where there may not be much proteinuria, but the patient's GFR gradually falls, gradually falls and goes into kidney failure. So why this difference in type 2 diabetes? The difference in type 2 diabetes is due to multiple factors which might be coexisting in that patient. Obesity, smoking, uh, uh, microvascular disease, macrovascular disease, all these might contribute to the worsening uh, GFR decline of a patient in type 2 diabetes, which is usually not seen in type 1 diabetes. So the rate of decline in GFR, which is seen in diabetic kidney disease, is like 7 to 12 ml per minute uh, over a year. So this is a pretty bad decline. And when you treat the patient properly with AC inhibitor A and B, the rate of decline can be controlled. But ultimately, what you have to say is, whatever done and tested, the patient's creatinine will slowly creep and come down to uh, azotemia and end-stage renal disease. There is a natural history of diabetic kidney disease. So once you diagnose a patient with diabetic kidney disease, you are accepting the fate. You are accepting the fate that this patient will finally end up in this pathway and what all you can uh, do to prevent the rapid progression. That is the only option that you are left with once you uh, tell that a patient is having diabetic kidney disease. So that is where the diagnosis of non-diabetic kidney disease uh, makes the difference. It is said that 10% of diabetics with renal dysfunction would be having a non-diabetic kidney disease. And 80% of the diabetics with some atypical features of renal dysfunction, which doesn't usually fit the pattern of diabetic kidney disease. Of them, the suspicious group, among, among them, almost 80% might be having a non-diabetic kidney disease. And the importance is the treatment of non-diabetic kidney disease differs from that of diabetic kidney disease. And most of the non-diabetic kidney disease have a good prognosis and can be reversible if you diagnose in time. So when do you suspect non-diabetic kidney disease? When a patient presents with a diabetic patient presents to you with sudden onset proteinuria without the previous microalbuminuria, microalbuminuria stages, sudden onset proteinuria, nephrotic range proteinuria with a normal renal function, unexplained acute kidney injury, Many a times diabetics can present with septis, sepsis, septic shock, and may have some renal dysfunction. So there you have an explanation of why the renal dysfunction occurred. But at times the patient can present with some AKI, which is unexplained by any of the patient's symptoms. Active urine sediments, RBC cars, WBC cars, dysmorphic RBCs, unexplained macroscopic hematuria, nephrotic range proteinia with no retinopathy. So these are clues that might hint that the renal disease that you are dealing with in that particular diabetic is not a diabetic kidney disease, but something else. And the famous renal-retinal relationship. Type 1 diabetic patients with nephropathy, about 90% will have retinopathy. But in type 2 diabetic patients with nephropathy, only 60 patients might be having retinopathy. And it is said that proliferative diabetic retinopathy correlates well with diabetic kidney disease. So in the absence of retinopathy, there is a fairly good chance that you might be dealing with a non-diabetic kidney disease. And 80% of the patients uh, without diabetic retinopathy had actually non-diabetic kidney disease. And absence of diabetic retinopathy might point towards a non-diabetic kidney disease in type 2 diabetics. So this is the famous study from CNC Vellore where they looked at the positive predictive value 
of diagnosing a non diabetic kidney disease in a patient without without diabetic retinopathy dr negative without diabetic retinopathy so when you just correlate it with just the presence of a renal failure the positive predictive value is less 69% but in the absence of retinopathy if you have a nephrotic syndrome if you have a nephrotic syndrome if you have a case of rapidly progressive renal failure then the chances that you might be dealing with a non diabetic kidney disease is fairly high 93%, 90%, even 100% when you are dealing with a rapidly progressive renal failure in the absence of diabetic retinopathy. So these are some common types of diabetic, non-diabetic kidney disease that you might come across. Acute kidney injury causing ones like acute tubular injury, acute tubular interstitial nephritis. Some of them present with nephritic syndrome where you could be dealing with an infection-related glomerular nephritis or an IgA nephropathy. Nephrotic syndrome presentations can be different. Myeloma kidney. Some of the cases might be that of an ischemic nephropathy, atheroembolic renal disease, renal stone disease, and notorious, notorious and very common urinary tract infections, which can be easily diagnosed. That may be a complicated urinary tract infection like a pyelonephritis or a pyelonephritis which has gone in for a papillary necrosis. So, so that is the thing. Whenever you are dealing with some form of atypicality, then you have to further evaluate. Keep your threshold low for a renal biopsy and keep diabetic kidney disease as a diagnosis of exclusion. Renal artery uh, stenosis. Whenever you are dealing with an asymmetric kidney in ultrasound, the patient is having severe peripheral vascular disease. You get femoral, femoral brewy carotid brewing, and at times, if you are lucky, you may even get a renal brewing, and uh, other history of macrovascular complications, difficult to control hypotension. So these are the uh, scenarios when you have to suspect that a worsening creatinine and hypertension in the patient with the diabetes could be a renal artery stenosis. And these are the patients who develop worsening of renal function when you start them on AC inhibitor, ARB, or SGLT2 inhibitor. So uh, I I'll be presenting few cases which uh, these, these cases are very close to my heart because after becoming a consultant, uh, I was blessed to get very good cases uh, to strengthen my knowledge and so that I can uh, help others also out. So this is a 52-year-old male, diabetic, chronic smoker. He presented with altered sensory uh, to the casualty. His BP was very high. The fundus was showing papillary edema. So this is a case of hypertensive encephalopathy. Uh, this patient actually got admitted under the neurologist and uh, neurologist is my friend. So uh, when he evaluated, he found that the patient's creatinine is around 2, hemoglobin is 16, which can be explained by his chronic smoker status. But urine, everything was normal. He was finding it very difficult to control this blood pressure. He had multiple antihypertensives on, but the BP was not getting controlled. And the ultrasound was showing some uh, asymmetry in kidney cells. So that is when we were called in and uh, with the presence of this hypokalemia and hypertensive encephalopathy in a chronic smoker with asymmetric kidney, we had no doubt that we could be dealing with a renal artery stenosis. And a renal artery Doppler was done, which showed that uh, there was indeed renal artery stenosis on the left side. And this is a CT angiogram, which shows that there is complete cutoff, complete cutoff of the left renal artery at the, at the initial part of the osteo. So this patient had a very difficult time. Uh, high blood pressures, but once we had a diagnosis of urine, unilateral renal artery stenosis, we knew which drug to start. We started the patient on an uh, uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, Tenisartan, and his BP got controlled. We also did some lifestyle modification. As you can see, that the HB was uh, 16. So this is a highly this high, hyper viscosity caused by secondary uh, polycythemia due to smoking. So we did a venesection. We asked the patient to stop smoking. Uh, his BP started coming down. BP started becoming manageable with a single antihypertensive and uh, patient improved. Urinary tract infections are something which we always miss, especially in elderly, where there can be associated benign prostatic hypertrophy. And diabetes itself can cause diabetic cystopathy, urethral stenosis. These patients can present with recurrent UTI, and uh, that might be the reason for worsening renal function. And on top of that, if someone without knowing adds an SGLT2 inhibitor also in the mix of anti-diabetic drugs, then you had it. The UTI versions 
fungal UTI and it gets complicated. And these are usually seen in patients with poorly controlled diabetes. Sometimes they can even give you a history of uh, cheesy, fleshy material coming out through the urine. That, that could be actually a sloughed papilla due to a pyelonephritis which is happening in, in the kidneys. So this was a case of a 70-year-old female with diabetes and severe peripheral neuropathy. And her blood sugars were very badly controlled. Creatine was around too. And she was getting this recurrent urinary tract infection. And that was causing uh, an acute on CKD with worsening creatinine. And uh, it was very uh, clear the bladder was palpable. So the USD showed glossy distended bladder with bilateral H1. So whenever you get this pattern, it shows that there is some form of bladder outlet obstruction. And in diabetics, when you deal with bladder outlet obstruction, if it is a male, then you're look, you're initially you'll be looking for uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy. But in a female, you are mainly worried about urethric structure ureteral structure. So we did a cystoscopy and ureteroscopy. There was no structure. So that is when we considered the possibility of a neurogenic bladder. So this is a urodynamic study. In urodynamic study, different uh, pressure monitors are kept in different parts of the body, uh, on the abdomen, uh, inside the bladder, uh, and also, uh, so we can measure the pressures, different pressures in different parts of the body. So these peaks that you are seeing, these intermittent peaks that you are seeing is actually the point where we are asking the patient to cough. And this graph in the bottom actually shows the uh, detrusor pressure. This is the detrusor pressure. So when the patient coughs, actually the detrusor pressure should also come. And uh, the when we ask the patient to start voiding, the pressure in the detrusor should rise. So you can see that the detrusor is hardly moving. So this was a case of hypoactive neurogenic bladder due to peripheral severe peripheral neuropathy in diabetes. So this was the reason for her urinary tract obstruction. So this is a patient who, who cannot initiate a normal voiding. So in this patient, we advised intermittent self-catheterization. So that was the only reason. Uh, with this intermittent self-catheterization, it, initially it was difficult for the patient, but still she learned very fast. And now she has become completely catheter-free. Uh, she voids herself every six hours a day. And her creatine has also come down and she is better and there is no more recurrent urinary tract infection. So this urinary retention was the one which was causing her recurrent urinary tract infection, which got addressed. So this is a 60-year-old male with hypertension. Uh, he had hypertension for almost 10 years. And uh, he's a chronic smoker. He was a diabetic on uh, metformin. And, uh, and there was no retinopathy on fundus examination. And this patient had a creatine of flow. No retinopathy, creatine of 4, diabetic, uh, sugars, not that well controlled, but HP1C around 7.5. And the urine showed this finding, 2 plus albumin and 3 plus RBC. This is microscopic hematuria. And uh, whenever see, we see a microscopic hematuria along with mild albuminuria, what we are concerned is about an ephritic syndrome. So with hypertension, we did a urine microscopic examination and we found this. Now, uh, urine microscopy is something which should be which is very close to the heart of a nephrologist because uh, um, as Srilada Madam says, urine is like liquid gold. You can diagnose far many things from just looking at the peak of the urine. It is almost like a liquid biopsy of the kidney. Uh, uh, when where the place where I was trained, uh, our chief was very pertinent that we ourselves do urine routine examination. And in this particular patient, urine routine examination showed this. These are RBCs. And you can see that the RBCs are having small projections. Small projections. I think this one, ah, yes. RBCs are showing small projections. So this is actually what is called as a Mickey Mouse sign or a acanthocyte. These are acanthocytes. Acanthocytes are RBCs which originate in the urinary tract at the site of the glomerulus. So whenever you see an acanthocyte in the uh, urine, that shows that it is what we are dealing with the with is a glomerular hematuria. So as the RBCs pass from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule, into the proximal convoluted tubule, through the loop of Henle, distal connecting, uh, distal connecting tubule, and to the collecting duct, uh, the RBC is exposed to different osmotic gradients. So that creates uh, the uh, weakening of the membrane of the RBCs and these projections come out. These are called acanthocytes, and it uh, signifies a glomerular hematuria. So uh, we went directly went ahead and did a renal biopsy uh, to know what the cause of this 
uh, nephritic syndrome was. So this is a normal glomerulus. This is a normal glomerulus. It is a PAS uh, periodic uh, acid shift stain, normal glomerulus. You can see the loops, glomerular loops. And in between the glomerular loops, you can see some area. So this area is called the mesangium. So ideally in a kidney biopsy, when you look at a glomerulus, you have to see all these opened up loops and the mesangium should be only this much. So we did a renal biopsy for this particular patient and we found that, see, the glomerular loops are actually fine, but the intervening mesangium is expanded. So this is the case of mesangial expansion. So whenever we see mesangial expansion in a patient with nephritic syndrome, the things that we have read about is uh, IgA nephropathy. So this is an uh, immunofluorescent stain of IgA in the glomerulus and it lit up. So this was a case of dominant or co-dominant IgA stain in a patient with mesangial expansion who presents with uh, nephrotic syndrome. You are dealing with a IgA nephrotic. So this was a case of IgA nephrotic. Now the thing is that this patient was actually having a secondary hypertension. This hypertension the patient was having was actually a secondary hypertension due to an undiagnosed IgA nephropathy. So in the biopsy, you can see that there is no features of diabetes. The, all the renal dysfunction this patient actually had was due to an undiagnosed IgA nephropathy and a, a small acute tubular injury with the patient had. And, and the good thing regarding IgA nephropathy has got, is we have different options available now. For diabetes, well, diabetic nephropathy, we have only few options. We can uh, control the blood sugars, we can control the hypertension, we can use AC inhibitors, ARB. That's it. And nowadays we are even using SGLT2 inhibitors and Pendromon. But in the case of IgA nephropathy, we have got different, uh, different drugs. And the prognosis of IgA nephropathy is not as bad as that of diabetic nephropathy. The rate of decline in GFR is not as bad as that of diabetic nephropathy. So in that way, we have we were able to put the correct diagnosis to the patient. We have initiated the patient on ACE inhibitors ARB at high maximum dose. Uh, we have now started the patient on uh, uh, nephigen, uh, that is uh, oral bledesonide, which has been now proposed as a good treatment for IgA nephropathy. Patient is doing well. Now, this is another case where a 45-year-old female with type 2 diabetes. Patient is on glimepiride and metformin. She presented with anasarca. Anasarca means diffused uh, uh, facial puffiness and puffiness, leg puffiness, diffuse the edema of the whole of the body. And that is a five days duration. Five, before five days, she was absolutely normal. In five days, she had developed this anasarca. So, sudden onset anasarca. And when we did a urine routine examination, albumin was 3 plus. 24 hour urine protein showed around uh, 20 grams of uh, protein leak per day. So, that is the case of nephrotic range proteinuria. Nephrotic range proteinuria. And there was a mild renal dysfunction. And so, this means this pattern, even though this patient is diabetic, this pattern is not a pattern that is seen in diabetic kidney disease. So, this is the urine routine examination. In urine routine examination, this is what is called as a fatty cast. Fatty cast. So, whenever we see a fatty cast, uh, I have a, a very close friend of mine, a pathologist who is working just nearby. He is also very fond of urine routine examination. So, whenever I find these fatty cast, I run to him to look for further details. And this is what he found. This is what is called as a this is a urine microscopic examination under polarized light. And this is what is called a Maltese cross appearance. Maltese cross appearance. So this pattern is classical of nephrotic range proteinuria in nephrotic syndrome. So this is a patient who presented with nephrotic syndrome. A diabetic patient who presented with sudden onset nephrotic syndrome. So we went ahead with renal biopsy. And the renal biopsy showed that patient was having actually an acute tubular injury and also features which are consistent with minimal change disease. We know that minimal change disease we usually diagnose in children, but adult onset minimal change disease is also described and it's uh, fairly common. And the good thing regarding minimal change disease in the adults is the same that of children, it responds very well to steroids. So this patient was started on 2 mg per kg steroid. It was actually a tough call because the patient was already diabetic and was on oral hypoglycemic agents. So we started her on uh, uh, steroids. There was some worsening of diabetes. We controlled it with insulin and other uh, measures. And by around uh, by around uh, six weeks, we got remission of proteinuria. And the proteinuria subsided. The proteinuria became zero. The patient's anasarca uh, resolved. And now the patient is completely normal. And we slowly tapered off the steroids. And uh, the blood sugars also is now uh, very well controlled. This was a 62-year-old male, diabetic on insulin. 
patient had features of lower uh, urinary tract symptoms for the past four years. And uh, now this patient was from Gudalu. He actually presented with fatigue to his local hospital and he was diagnosed to have anemia. And uh, total count, uh, platelet count, everything was normal. Uh, sorry, this MCV is 80. 80. And uh, normal cytic normochromic anemia. ESR was towards the higher side. Patient's urine, uh, USG examination showed that the kidneys were normal in size. And because of the severe anemia and fatigue, three blood transfusions were given. Uh, and um, and this pattern, and this patient also had some bone pain, weight, uh, so tiredness and all. So this pattern is very familiar to us. It is very familiar to us. It is a, a pattern which we usually see in patients with multiple myeloma. So this patient initially came to the urology department, but the urology consultant uh, on that spot itself, he identified that this is not a urological issue, but a nephrological issue. So this patient was referred to me. But the problem the patient had was financial concerns. No money. So in order to diagnose a multiple myeloma, what all I have to do? I have to do a bone marrow examination. I have to do a, a serum electrophoresis for m -band. That too may not be convincing at times. Then the patient most of the time will end up in doing immunofixation electrophoresis and all those things you know that it is very costly. So I had to find out some way to say that this patient had this disease and the, the, a diagnosis was required uh, so that the further treatment of the patient can be planned. So this was the, one of the cheap tests that we did. So this patient's urine routine examination, I have mentioned here, urine albumin was nil, RBC was nil. But in this presence, you, since you are suspecting a multiple myeloma, you can always do this particular test. This was actually a urine exam, urine test, a test done in urine. This is called sulfosalicylic acid test. And it's it helps to precipitate proteins. Now you will ask, the urine routine examination showed no albumin. Then how come uh, you got this much proteins in urine? The urine dipstick that we usually do in clinical practice can only detect can only detect albumin. But in a case with multiple myeloma, the proteins that are lost in urine is not albumin, but it is the light chains which are synthesized by the uh, neoplastic plasma cells. And light chains are much smaller and they have a different uh, biochemical properties that of albumin. So in the usual dipstick analysis, albumin will not, in no protein will be detected. Albumin will show as nil. But in fact, the protein, the urine of that protein was studded. You can see the level of protein, how this much only urine have we had taken. This much was protein. So we added this reagent called sulfosalicylic acid and it showed this precipitate. So with this precipitate, I'm sure that is, we are dealing with uh, multiple myeloma. So we convinced the patient that see you have a, you are having a problem with the urine you have a renal disease which is due to uh, a pro probably a neoplastic etiology multiple myeloma and that is the reason for your anemia and we somehow convinced the patient to do one single test that single test we directly went ahead with renal biopsy we didn't do serum electrophoresis for and band we did not do a bone marrow study we did not do an immunofixation we directly went into a renal biopsy. And the real biopsy showed the classical feature of myeloma. So these are renal tubules. These are renal tubules. And inside the renal tubules, you can see some material. So this is actually a fractured cast of myeloma cast nephropathy. So this was cast nephropathy, which is classical of myeloma. We did a immunofixation uh, of Kappa chain, which did not show any, any take up. But when we did a lambda chain, it lit up. It lit up like anything. So this was a case of lambda lambda light chain myeloma myeloma the patient also had a lamb, uh, lambda light chain deposition disease lambda light chain cast nephropathy so with this diagnosis we could uh, very happily go to the oncologist uh, doctor i have a case of multiple myeloma and i have diagnosed it through a renal biopsy and uh, renal biopsy and multiple myeloma is a myeloma defining illness kindly treat this patient for multiple myeloma and eventually, uh, uh, this patient, other investigations were done. But with a single uh, go of urine examination and kidney biopsy, we could give a proper diagnosis to the patient. And uh, the patient is now initiated on what is on the protein. So this is an X-ray skull of this patient. So this is showing a very small light lesion here and there. But with this light lesion and X-ray, I can't approach the oncologist asking for starting treatment. But this a renal biopsy is a myeloma-defining illness and a treatment can be initiated even with this report. This is another case, a 70-year-old female with type 2 diabetes. 
and uh, with the creatinine of 5. Now volume overload, creatinine of 10. So there is an acute on CKD. And patient had to be started on dialysis because the patient had volume overload features. Patient had normal kidneys, which can be seen in diabetic patients, even in the advanced stages of diabetic kidneys. The size of the kidneys can be normal. Urine showed 3 plus albuminuria. RBC was not good. Now the bystanders wants to know, uh, can, will my mother ever be dialysis free? Will she uh, require dialysis lifelong? Or are we dealing with something which is temporary? So I had to give an answer. So I told them we'll wait for one month. If it is an acute kidney injury, it will resolve. And probably after one month, we'll be able to take off the catheter and your mother could become dialysis free. One month passed. But the patient was, patient was not making any urine. The bystanders are growing uh, suspicious. What to do? And I am also growing suspicious because if the patient is not going to make any urine, I have to plan an AV fistula and all those stuff. And we have to make sure that further uh, dialysis of the patient has to be taken care of. So we wanted to know whether or not the patient's kidney uh, injury is reversible. So we directly went ahead and did a renal biopsy. Renal biopsy showed that patient has RPS class 3 diabetic nephropathy, but the current cause of worsening was actually an acute tubular injury. And the good thing regarding acute tubular injury is if we support the patient till the tubular injury resolves, it resolves and patient will again start making urine. So one day the patient's bystander called me. Sir, today, that is after one and a half months, one and a half months, the patient's bystander calls me and tells the patient, uh, today my mother passed around the 200 ml of urine. Not much, but 200 ml of urine has come. Okay, I told, okay, we'll continue dialysis, but we'll wait. The next day he calls me and says, okay, the uh, mother has passed around uh, 500 ml of urine. But then I said, okay, I think there was some recovery happening. We'll wait. The third day he called and told me, Mother just passed 2,000 ml of urine. Third day, 5,000 ml of urine. So this was a case of a recovering acute tubular injury. And this is what is called as a polyuric phase of acute tubular injury. So within uh, another one week, the patient's urine output improved like anything. Patient became off dialysis. I could remove the catheter. And patients and bystanders are also happy. So just by doing a renal biopsy, we could uh, reassure the bystanders and we could also plan ourselves that this patient may not require dialysis lifelong. And there is a good possibility that patient would recover from the renal dysfunction. This was a 65-year-old male with chronic chronic smoker, type 2 diabetes mentis on uh, oral hypoglycemic agents. Now, this patient uh, presented with breathlessness of five-day duration. Uh, he had high blood pressures. Uh, he was not uh, hypotensive before. And there was some eczematous rash over the leg. Creatine was around 5. Urine was showing active urine sediments, 3 plus RBCs, RBCs passed. So what we are dealing with here is an acute nephritic syndrome. The patient who was not hypotensive becoming hypotensive, the patient becoming volume overload with worsening creatinine and the presence of a nephritic uh, pattern in urine routine examination. So whenever we find nephritic syndrome in patients with diabetics, we usually look for focus of infection. So in this case, this patient had an eczematous rash over the leg. Uh, that was actually a pyoderma. So just like the uh, in pediatrics, you get this post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Similarly, in adults, you can get something what is called as an infection-related glomerulonephritis, which presents as acute nephritic syndrome. So we did a C3, C4, which showed that it's a low C3. Uh, ASO titers were uh, elevated. So we did a renal biopsy. So as I showed you earlier, in the glomerulus, all the loops should be clearly visible. But in this particular case, you can see that none of the loops you are able to visualize because the loops are filled with proliferating, exudating cells, which are actually neutrophils. These are all neutrophils. So this pattern is called an exudative endocapillary proliferative glomerulonephritis, which is very classical of infection-related glomerulonephritis. So mind you, this patient had a background of diabetic nephropathy in the real biopsy, but the current cause of acute worsening was an endocapillary proliferative a global nephritis, which could be an infection related illness. So, what we did is we treated his eczema, we treated that pyoderma. She, he had a very poor oral hygiene, multiple uh, uh, carry screws and uh, gum abscesses. We, uh, we drained all that, we uh, 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 removed the infection focus from everywhere, uh, and patients' uh, creatine starts uh, came down, BP got controlled, and uh, creatine also came down to around uh, 2, I think, 2 something. So uh, this is a 60-year-old male with type 2 diabetes on OHA. He had retinopathy, creatinine around 2. 
he had a chest pain acute coronary syndrome uh, so he had to undergo a coronary artery uh, uh, coronary angiogram and uh, one ptca was done it was an lada stenosis um, but two days after the ptca patient develops worsening renal dysfunction creatinine jumps to around uh, 5 and patient becomes uh, becomes volume overload so we had to control the uh, volume overload with diuretics so what may be the cause? The first thing that usually comes to our mind is what we are dealing with is a contrast associated nephropathy. But I would tell you that the prevalence of contrast nephropathy is actually much less. But here, the thing that we were worried about was something much more sinister. So we uh, are once stabilizing the patient's creatinine was not coming down, worsening. So we did a renal biopsy. There's a glomerulus. So the glomerulus is classically showing what you call as a Kimmelstein Wilson lesions. These are Kimmelstein Wilson nodules which are classical of diabetic nephropathy. And uh, this is an uh, IgG immunofixation, which showed linear IgG stain, staining. This is also another feature of diabetic nephropathy. But this slide is something which picked up the diagnosis. You can see this is an arterioid in the renal biopsy. And you can see a, a cleft, a cleft inside the, a cleft inside the arterioid. So whenever, Mm, uh, we find such a pattern in the patient who has recently underwent an intravascular interventional procedure. What we are worried about is the atheroembolic renal disease. Atheroembolic renal disease. So when you do an angioplasty or angio, uh, angiogram, uh, they pass the catheter through the coronaries into the, uh, they usually pass the catheter through the right subclavian, the radial artery, and it enters the right subclavian, and they reach here at the coronary ostia and shoot the dye. And that is how they and do the coronary angiogram. While doing this, there might be atheromatous plaques all over the walls of these vessels. So when these catheter and uh, uh, wires and everything are operated here, they can get irritated and they can embolize. They can go down and go down and go into these structures. What are these structures which takes up around 20% of your cardiac output? These are my poor renal arteries which are leading into the kidney. So uh, these emboli can shower into the renal artery and they can get occluded in these small minute arterioles and can cause an inflammation, necroinflammation, which can worsen renal function and cause acute worsening of renal dysfunction. Uh, these are called cholesterol clefts because cholesterol was there, but you are not seeing it because when you process the renal biopsy through the different alcohols, silines and all the other alcohols, the cholesterol, which is fatty, gets uh, uh, they get uh, they, the things they are soluble, they get washed off. And what you are left with is only a, the, uh, the, uh, the space that it occupied, which is called as the cholesterol effect. So this patient, we had to wait patiently. Uh, we didn't require dialysis, but we slowly, as the inflammation settled, uh, his renal function improved. Uh, but he's not doing that good. We had still around four or five, but we have a diagnosis. We have a diagnosis. The diagnosis is the patient is actually having atheroembolic renal disease. And when the presence of such a scenario, you can get other features. You can look for blue toe syndrome because some of these emboli may go into the femoral arteries and into the peripheral lower limb vessels and produce blue toe syndrome. And in the retina, you can see something called as a hall and house plaques. And there can be other features of uh, atheroembolic renal disease. This is a 60-year-old male who presented with type uh, who had type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, this patient is actually not my patient exactly, but I'm presenting it because it is a very common scenario. I borrowed it from one of my friends. So uh, this patient is having proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, pan retinal photocoagulation for done was done for that. This baseline creatinine is around 3. He presented with acute worsening of real dysfunction. We had to become 6. He had a very bad hypertension, which was becoming very difficult to control on multiple resistant hypertension on multiple antihypertensive. A particular history, a particular history from this patient made us to do a renal biopsy. And the renal biopsy showed a, a collapsing glomerular nephropathy. Chroma, collapsing glomerular nephropathy is usually described in patients with HIV. This patient's viral markers, everything is negative. But in this particular patient, it carries significance. We know that this patient had a very bad proliferative diabetic retinopathy along with the renal uh, pan retinal photoagulation one other treatment was also offered to the patient, that is an anti-VGF therapy with devices in mind. And this is a, a photo from a, uh, uh, an article from NEJM, which describes the uh, anti-VGF uh, thrombotic microangiopathies. So you can uh, uh, focus in this area. So this is the uh, kidney. 
you have the podocyte, you have the basement membrane, you have the endothelial cells. Now, podocyte secretes a thing called vascular endothelial growth factor. And this vascular endothelial growth factor binds to the receptors over the endothelial cells in the kidney and make sure that the uh, endothelial cell health is maintained. But in the presence of vivacizumab or anti-VEGF molecules, in the presence of VEGF molecules, these, uh, this uh, VEGF binds to anti-VEGF molecules and vascular endothelial growth factor is no more available for the receptors to that. Through that. So the health of the endothelium is uh, uh, worsened and the patients uh, can develop thrombosis, uh, endotheliosis, and even collapsing globulopathy. So the presence of collapsing globulopathy is a telltale sign of the anti-VEGF therapy. Uh, and uh, I think some of, at least some of the PGs can identify this molecule here. Do you see this molecule? Have you heard about this molecule anywhere in your academics? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, this is, a, this is a molecule which is described in preeclampsia, SFLT1. This SFLT1 also has some similar action. You know that in preeclampsia, the thing which happens in the kidney is actually glomerular endotheliosis. So the reason for the glomerular endotheliosis in preeclampsia is that this SFLT1 is actually a decoy receptor for vascular endothelial growth factor, which acts very similar to the bevacizumab bacteria. And uh, that also creates similar you know, pattern of injury. So when I uh, discuss this matter with our ophthalmology friends, <laughs> they frown at me. They say that, do you know how much anti-VEGF uh, we are giving for a particular case? So I asked how much? Uh, are you giving 0.5 ml? Are you giving 1 ml? No, no, no. And the uh, eyeball is so small. I can give, give only a very minimal uh, amount of this uh, uh, this uh, drug into the eye. They give only 0 0.05 ml. So you can say that how this 0 0.05 ml is damaging uh, this 10 centimeter, 9 centimeter kidneys. That is what the ophthalmologist says. But I have an answer for that. These are not just some uh, some uh, some small drug. These are monoclonal antibodies. They are very potent. They are uh, they are state of heart molecules. So whatever the volume you give in a patient who is already having some renal dysfunction due to diabetes, when you give this, there is a fair chance that patient can, can have a person. So Whenever some patient comes to me for fitness for procedure for bevacizumab injection, I look at the baseline pattern of this patient. If the patient is already stage 3 or stage 4 kidney disease, I give the fitness only under high risk. I will explain the thing to the patient and say that there is a fair chance that you might have a worsening of renal dysfunction and that can even end up in dialysis since your uh, current state of CKD is around stage 3 or stage 4. But in patient with normal renal function, I might give uh, fitness without much of a problem. This is another patient, a 50-year-old male with type 2 diabetes who's on treatment for the past six months, six years. Patient had non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and creatinine around 1.5. And this patient is also not my case, but uh, it, it was a case that we went through when I was in training in Stanley Medical College. And uh, in Tamil Nadu people, in Tamil Nadu, uh, many patients are obsessed with Siddha medication. Uh, they have very good trust on Siddha medication. So whenever a patient gets diagnosed with a renal stone or a, diabetes, or a diabetes, they initially approach the Siddha uh, practitioners. And uh, uh, it is proven that most or many of the Siddha medication contains heavy metals, mercury is And, uh, and we, are, we have been finding this pattern in uh, Chennai, in and around Chennai, uh, that uh, these patients develop nephrotic range proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome once they are exposed to these Siddha medication. So uh, when we did a renal biopsy, you can see that there is evidence of uh, diabetic nodular, uh, all these things are there. But along with that, you can see that the basement membrane is so thickened and you can see mild projections in the basement membrane. Uh, this is a silver stain of the basement membrane in high power. You can see that the basement membrane is not only thickened, but you can see these minute projections. Are you able to appreciate? So these are called spikes. Spikes pattern in brain, uh, basement membrane. This is uh, something which is classical of membranous nephropathy. And uh, we have been seeing quite a few of cases of membranous nephropathy in, in around Chennai, which was uh, which was uh, which happened after exposure to Siddha medication. And uh, Dr. Anila Abraham, a renal pathologist, 
uh, who is working in Chennai has um, has been collecting these cases, and she has noticed that uh, in world literature it has been described, but in our population we have been seeing that this particular usually membranous nephropathy is associated with PLA two R antibodies, PLA two R antibodies. But this particular membranous nephropathy due to exposure to Siddha medication is usually NL1 positive. And uh, the good thing regarding this is this usually resolves with time once you stop those drugs and some of the resistant cases will respond to steroids. So these were the few cases that um, I um, had during my training and, and after once I became a consultant. And, uh, so my concluding remarks are very simple. The prevalence of non-diabetic kidney disease among diabetics might be in, on an increasing trend because of the current era of changing epidemiology of diabetes. Why I change changing epidemiology of diabetes? Because diabetes is very common. Uh, when you look at a population of 100, you might find that uh, almost 50 to 60% of patients might be diabetes, diabetics. So attributing all renal diseases happening in the, those patients to diabetes alone may not be wise since the number of diabetics have improved uh, uh, tremendously. And also, non-diabetic kidney disease has got a better prognosis and have more treatment options, just like the case of uh, IgA nephropathy and or uh, infection-related glomerulonephritis that we saw. And uh, non-diabetic kidney disease has the potential to accelerate uh, the progression of diabetic kidney. Just imagine that patient with multiple myeloma. If we had assumed that this patient was just having uh, diabetic kidney disease, the patient would have worsened. The myeloma would have worsened and, and that itself might be the cause of patient ending up in dialysis. And the spectrum of non-diabetic kidney disease is vast and can be missed without a biopsy. That, that is the reason. Whenever you have some atypical feature of renal dysfunction in a patient with diabetics, keep your threshold of doing a renal biopsy low. And as my chief, uh, Dr. Edwin Sir, always used to say, uh, always keep the diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease as a diagnosis of exclusion. So uh, that's all. Thanking you. Thanking you. And uh, these are my credits. Uh, Dr. Angela Abraham, the renal pathologist who has been reporting my renal biopsies. And Dr. Devotion, who is very good at uh, urine microscopy and uh, always helps me out uh, during uh, treatment of my cases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin, for an uh, excellent uh, presentation. It was very simple, crisp, and uh, clear presentation, and a lot of uh, take home message for the practicing physician and diabetologist. And uh, the most important thing, uh, as you rightly told, we have to recognize the atypical features in a patient with a renal impairment in diabetes. And uh, we have to consider a DKD as a diagnosis of exclusion and the role of uh, kidney biopsy. And I think uh, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, queries from our uh, participants. I uh, There are a few queries I go through. One is from uh, yes. that is uh, the NSID use and how often NSID abuse can cause non-diabetic kidney disease in diabetes. And this chronic uh, PPA use could be harmful to kidneys. This is by uh, Dr. R. Uh, Rajapol from Nagarkovil, Kanyakumari district. It's a very important question. And uh, Martin. Uh, yes, sir. That is actually a uh, very common scenario which we come across, especially in patients who are, uh, are having very badly controlled diabetes, might be having what is called as a periarthritis of shoulder. And many a times when they approach uh, practitioners in the periphery, orthopedicians and uh, um, casualty medical officers often prescribe NSAIDs. Uh, NSAIDs, yes, NSAIDs can cause an acute worsening of creatinine. So whenever we come across patients with acute jump in creatinine with an already low baseline creatinine, we always go through the drug chart. Drug chart. Drug chart review is always important. We always ask them whether or not they have been taking any other drugs other than the routine, whether they are not, whether they have taken any uh, NSAIDs, whether they have taken any native medication. So that is a usual question. So when we find that there is a uh, um, exposure to native medications or NSAIDs, so th that is the situation when we already know that this is a explainable cause of acute kidney injury. So in those cases, we may not uh, do a renal biopsy straight away. We just wait, we just wait and watch. 
we just uh, support the kidneys till it recovers. And many a times it recovers also. But in a certain condition, especially chronic PPI use, uh, though I have not personally seen a case, um, uh, there has been instances where a uh, tubular interstitial disease has been described. Tubular interstitial disease. And the uh, thing regarding tubular interstitial disease is urine, uh, urine, everything will be very blank. There will be acute jump in creatinine and the patient may not be oliguric. Urine output will be still there, but the creatinine will be jumping, jumping, jumping. So in those cases, many a times these patients present with rapidly progressive renal failure. Rapidly. So in those cases, uh, we might require a biopsy to make sure that that is the cause. Uh, so what we usually do is we ask, ask patients to take proton pump inhibitors only when uh, required and not as on a daily basis. And whenever we get an opportunity to discourage patients away from routine intake of uh, proton pump inhibitors, we always use that opportunity to discourage them. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Any other queries uh, or comments from the participants? Suresh, sir, any? Yeah, uh, uh, Rojit actually, you know, he took a good 45 minutes for his uh, presentation, but that 45 minutes just passed in a jiffy. Uh, we did not even know that it was 45 minutes. And we had a lot of uh, participation as well, not only from the state, but also from other out-of-the-state uh, people. Yeah. Who were joined. And uh, it's an excellent presentation. Uh, like now, as in the past, like when we had already had heard him during CFT, it is uh, as beautiful as he was, actually. And I think probably mm, uh, maybe this is one topic which actually uh, he had uh, hammered several points in one go. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yeah. Uh, Rojit, I think uh, we can conclude, no? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, sir.